So this is Unit 2, Section 3, which is the Etruscans. It's a fairly short section, as the Etruscans are, even though wrote stuff, it's been untranslated, so we don't really know a ton about them other than what other people wrote. Similar to some of the Aegean Greek cultures, in particular the Minoans. Uh, the Etruscans are settled mainly around the area today we call Tuscany. That's where the word comes from, right? Um, Florence, for those who you want to know, um, wasn't itself an Etruscan city. Uh, it was developed later, but nearby Florence is a tiny, small town called Fiasoli, which was Etruscan, and you can see some Etruscan ruins there. Um, and you can see some Roman ruins there as well. Arezzo is also still a city that you can visit, and some of these other ones um, are around. So you can see that the Etruscans did spread a little bit through Italy, um, and did have an area of influence in Italy. As a matter of fact, some of the first kings of Rome were actually Etruscans, um, until the Romans basically overthrew their kings and eventually even overthrew the Etruscans. Um, <clears throat> so they were in contact with the Greeks, as you can kind of see here. The southern part of Italy was basically Greece, and then eventually the Romans pop up in the center. Um, and, of course, the interaction between the Romans and the Etruscans and the Greeks and the Etruscans can be seen both in their art and their influence is on the Romans. The Etruscan history is also divided into three periods. Um, it's almost always conveniently three, right? In this case, the Villanovan, which is similar to the Greek geometric period, the Orientalizing, which is the exact same as the Greek Orientalizing, not exact same, but the same period. And then the Archaic, which also coincides with the Greek Archaic period. This is heavily influenced by Greece. Um, and then eventually they're kind of conquered and, and, and enveloped within the Romans. They're the first historical people in Italy. That means they had a right form of writing. Like I said, we have not been able to decipher Etruscan language, so we don't know what they think about themselves. Um, or maybe even what they called themselves. We know that the Greeks and the Romans called them Etruscans, and that may be what they called themselves, but we can't be 100% sure because we don't, haven't translated their writing. Right? Um, <clears throat> they're polytheistic, just like everyone else at this particular point in time, with the exception of the Jews and later the Christians, um, who one could debate neither are truly polytheistic, I mean, neither are truly monotheistic religions either. Um, but that's for another argument in another time in class. They basically, Etruscans, are a combination, three, three combo religions. They s took the Greek gods, for the most part, Apollo, Zeus, Neptune, no, not Neptune, the Roman, Apollo, Zeus, Poseidon, etc., um, but shared the Egyptian belief that when you died, you continued living the same life uh, and continued doing the same thing. So the Etruscans were very focused on the afterlife and continuing doing what you were doing and what you enjoyed in life to continue to do it in the afterlife. So they usually buried themselves with their favorite stuff, just like the Egyptians, although they did not mummify. Um but then they also did a really unique thing that's Etruscan um, that the Romans adopted, and that's having augurs. Augurs would basically kill animals in a ritual sacrifice format, and the way the animal died and then would, would matter to future events. Um, when you cut open the animal's stomach and intestines, what was in there uh, would be red and also predict future events or give bad omens. And then the liver was super important in this. And then depending on what was on the liver, the color of the liver, et cetera, and so on, you would determine, again, whether something was good luck, bad luck, et cetera, and so on. The Romans adopted that um, straight from the Etruscans. It was not a Roman idea until they ran into the Etruscans. Um, but everything is related to the afterlife, so most of their art is funereal. Funereal is a word. I did not spell funeral wrong. It's art that deals with dead and the the dead and with death. Okay, so Etruscan art characteristics are going to be materials. A lot of bronze, a lot of terracotta, a lot of tufa. Tufa is volcanic rock. Terracotta, everybody in Florida knows what that is because 
90% of the roofs in Florida are made of terracotta. That's that orange tile um, that you see on a lot of roofs in Miami and in a lot of those pots that people have in front of their homes are made of terracotta. It's easy easy to break, easy, but also easy to sh shape. Um, human proportions, not important. So unlike the Greeks, that everything had to be perfect, and unlike the Romans, everything had to look like it really looked. The Etruscans are more concerned that it's a human, good enough, it's symbolic, right? Um, they are the inventors of the arch. They are the first people who have arches. Um, most of their themes, again, are related to the afterlife, so you're going to have a lot of mythological themes, the heroes, the gods, these uh, mythological creatures and animals. Um, and again, almost all their art is related to funerals and tombs in the afterlife because they felt you could take it with you. So here's one of those arches. Let's see if I can get my little laser pointer up. So here's this arch, not this one. This arch is the Etruscan arch. Um, <laughs> it was fixed by Augustus and made fancier, as you can see. Um, but this is one of the many Etruscan arches. This is the best example um, in the city of Perugia. For those of you who, again, travel people, tip. Perugia is the city where the chocolate company is from, Perugia, where those bocce, the famous chocolate bocce, are from. You can get them really cheap here, obviously, because it's made here. Here's another arch that you can kind of see. Back to that Forum Borarium, if you remember, or maybe not back, in the future, when you, <laughs> when you watch the Roman thing, you'll see the Forum Borarium, and there's a circular temple back there, the Temple of Hercules, that's it here. Right behind it, in this archway, at the very bottom, which you can't really see well in this picture, but you're going to have to trust me, is the Cloaca Maxima, which is the original sewer that took water out of the Forum area so that it would drain into the river so that the forum wouldn't stay swampy, right? Uh, uh, later, it was turned into a full-blown sewer where, you know, you dumped your your bodily fluids, um, and it still works today. So the masterpiece of Etruscan art, which I have a problem with because I don't think it's a masterpiece, I think they've made much better artwork than this one, but that's not for me to decide, is the Apollo Ave. It's made of terracotta. As you can see, the arms and the feet in particular, if you look where it's broken, you can see it's hollow. Um, it, which, like I said, it's easily sculpted, but it's also delicate. So, um, this would have been on the top of a temple. So the Romans borrowed their idea of temples, which you'll see when you get to the Romans, not really from the Greeks, even though people always say that. They borrowed it from the Etruscans, who did borrow it from the Greeks. But, um, you'll notice there's a difference between an Etruscan temple and a Greek temple and a Roman temple. Um, and it is a test question, even. So, as you get to the Rome PowerPoints and the Rome videos, you'll see that. So, you're going to have to use your imagination here and pretend you don't see these two little kids. You know, it's hard to not imagine them there, but you're going to have to imagine them not there. The Etruscan artwork is just the wolf. Okay, it's she-wolf. This is famous because of those two little kids underneath it and the wolf, because it was rediscovered in the 1500s. And some artist, and there's some conjecture whether it was Raphael or Michelangelo or maybe both of them or Bramante, one of those famous Renaissance artists, sculpted the two little twins and stuck it under the wolf to mess with the Pope. Because the story of Romulus and Remus is Romulus and Remus were raised twin brothers of the son of the god Mars, raised by a she-wolf and founder of the city of Rome. So when they found the wolf... Someone said, wouldn't it be cool if the twins were nearby? And they never found them because it probably wasn't part of this artwork because it's Etruscan, not Roman. Why would they be telling a story of the Roman story of mythology? Um, so they added them on and said, look, we found this. It's proof that Romulus and Remus were real, right? And aggravated the Pope. So no big deal, but such a big deal later and in case you've ever been to Rome, if you've been, you already know. Um, if you haven't been, you will see this symbol everywhere in Rome. It's on the police cars, the fire trucks, the sewers. It's on one of the two soccer teams of the city of Rome. Um, it's everywhere. A drawing of this statue with the two twins under it. They fooled everybody. It wasn't until the 1900s 
that they figured out the two little guys underneath were fake. Now, I don't mean fake. They're real. They were sculpted and whatever, but it wasn't part of the original sculpture. But I don't know why it took him so long. If you look at it, this wolf isn't that good. right? It's not that good. It doesn't even look, per se, too much like a wolf. It's kind of weird looking, right? The hair is done poorly. But then these two kids have six packs. They're perfect. These are two little weightlifting kids going on here. It's like, you should have realized it couldn't have been the same artist. Um, but they tested the bronze, and obviously the age of the bronze is a thousand years, you know, 1,500 years apart. So um, this is a much better version. But again, they're still not good at hair. That's supposed to be a mane of a lion, right? It's not very good. That's supposed to be the hair on the back of a goat. Again, not very good. I mean, it's not horrible. Don't get me wrong. It's still good. Don't, don't, don't. But, um, so I'm not saying that these should be masterpieces, but I am saying that this should be. If you're going to have a masterpiece of Etruscan art, I have no idea why this one isn't included in that. This is an amazing work of art in that it captures a look, right? It looks like this kid's daydreaming. If you put those glass eyes in there, which were stolen, because maybe they were glass, maybe they were made of something else. Maybe it was a jewel, jewel, gemstone, or whatever. It would even look more realistic and more kind of cool. I can show you one with eyes in it, I think. I'm pretty sure. There you go. With the eyes still in it here. And see the difference of how realistic. Again, this is amazingly done. Now, I know why this one isn't considered uh, an Etruscan masterpiece, because it was, even though it's Etruscan, and even though it was Etruscan artist, it's of a Roman citizen. Um, so the Romans paid the Etruscan artists to do this, so it really wouldn't be an Etruscan artwork. It's more of a Roman artwork, even though it's Etruscan artists. Now, the Brutus name you see here is not the famous Brutus who betrays Julius Caesar. It's one of his ancestors, though. It's his great-great-great-great-grandfather. Uh, but this guy was a hero of the Republic. Right? He um, saved Rome. Uh, here's our Etruscan temple. So, again, when we get to the... When you've gone through the Greek temples and you get to the Roman temples, you'll notice it's much more in common with the Roman temple in that there's one staircase, as many stairs as you need to get up, and one set of entranceways. I can't come up this way and go in. I can't come up the back and go in. I can only go up the front and into the temple. Right? That's it. That's all I can do. This is where the statue of, of Apollo would have been. It would have been one of these roof statues. So the Romans copied more of the Etruscan style than the Greek style. But again, the Etruscans are copying the Greeks. So most of the tombs of the Etruscan wealthy people are built to look exactly like their homes and then built to show things they wanted to do or keep doing when they were dead. So these people obviously are having a banquet. They're having food. They're sitting around the dining room table. They're being served by servants. I know you see them lying down and you think they're sleeping, but uh, the Romans, Greeks... Etruscans and all ancient people until you get to the Middle Ages. Um, there were no chairs. Well, I shouldn't say that. There were chairs. There were no table and chairs. It was couches and chairs. You were supposed to sit and lie down and eat. It was supposedly better for the digestion. You weren't supposed to be sitting in a chair. Uh, sitting in a chair was to do work. Eating was to be relaxed, so you were lying down on a couch. Um, on a dining couch made just for that. Again, Roman, the Greek temple. Another temple picture. I guess I got that one out of order. Um, so most um, Etruscan ruins are not their cities because they made their cities out of wood. So we don't have anything except for maybe some holes in the ground. What we do have, however, are entire copies of those cities as a cemetery. So we call that a necropolis, a city of the dead. So this building over here is actually someone's house. It's built as a copy of that person's house in real life. If I go in here, there's going to be a bedroom, a living room, a kitchen, some sofas, all made of stone, of course, but as a copy of the house. So here in this bigger picture, the circle buildings are homes, then the straight line here in the middle, and then the square rectangular buildings on the side, those were businesses. So the cemetery is set up just like the village because you're still going to have to go to the store. You're still going to have to remember over here is the baker, and over here is the butcher, and over here is where the blacksmith is, right? And so it's set up exactly the same way. Um, so these tombs were for families and generations. So this is a great example of it, the Tomb of the Reliefs, because it's a bunch of relief sculptures on it. This guy was a blacksmith, right? He has swords, 
axes, picks, ropes, uh, shields, helmets, all the things that a blacksmith would make. You'll notice on the back wall here are two big open areas where you would have put the dead bodies, right? The tomb. Uh, and then if you can't really tell, but trust me, over here is another open area. That's when these bodies turn to bones. You would pick up the bones and put them back here so that now, you know, grandma and grandpa are dead. Now their bones put them here. Now mom and dad are here because they're dead. Their bones put them here. Now the son and the daughter are here. They're dead. Put the bones here. So it would last for generations. Obviously, this is a wealthy person's tomb with all this big empty space. You could even put other dead bodies down here. You can kind of see the lines for them in case a bunch of people died at the same time. But this would be the storage area once you turn to bones. Smaller, poorer people had smaller areas. Again, a couple of areas on the ground here you see where you would put the dead people. And then the bones up here. This person didn't have as much money as the, as the other person did. So it's a much smaller tomb. But this is the tomb of the hunting and fishing because guess what's happening in this tomb? People are hunting and fishing. Um, and obviously the guy who died loved hunting and fishing, so he wants to keep doing it in the afterlife. Okay. This is another one that could be considered a masterpiece. And again, not because necessarily it's great, but because it's representative of Etruscan culture in so many different ways. There are hundreds of these sarcophagi of couples sitting down on a couch, eating again. Remember, we talked about lying on a couch is not sleeping, they're eating. They don't want to sleep together eternally on a bed, but they did like to go eat, so they buried themselves in a coffin. Sarcophagus is a fancy word for coffin. Their bodies would be in this part down here, eating. What you're missing here is whatever he would be holding in his hand, maybe a grape, and his arm is broken. He would have had a plate here with food. You can see she's reaching to pick up some food. And he has some food in his hand. Unfortunately, the food items are gone. But you can see that this is a, this is a, a, a scenario of people eating, not a scenario of people sleeping. And there's some more of the different tombs, so I can kind of give you an idea. Again, the circle ones generally are homes, generally, almost all the time. And then these rectangular ones are generally businesses. Again, generally, not necessarily all the time. Sometimes there's an exception. And it is set up just like the city, even including some of them having, oh, you can see it here, some of them having a road. It's like, why am I going to need a road when I'm dead? But it's it's there. Um, there are some really cool Etruscan tombs in the Tuscan area and near Rome as well. And that should wrap us up for this quick, short Etruscan one.